Today is another special episode of Commercial Real Estate Pro Network, uh, our CREPN radio uh, podcast. And uh, today we're, we're uh, tackling the topic of COVID-19 and its effect on uh, real estate and the uh, broader economy. And to do so today, I've got a uh, special friend, a returning guest, uh, uh, no, or excuse me, uh, Neil Bawa. He's um, a syndicator, he's a data scientist, uh, and uh, makes that a friend here. And uh, we are gonna talk with him about uh, the, just the, the, the broadness of this and how he thinks it will affect not only the, the economy, but just specifically the multifamily and real estate markets and uh, what the prospects for recovery are. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome in Neil Bawa. Neil, welcome back. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me on the show again. Well, as I mentioned, uh, you've, you've been on the program before, but if you could just take a quick minute and uh, share with the listeners a little bit more about your background, then we'll, we'll get into it. Sure. I'm a technologist, a data scientist, a proud geek. Um, I like uh, the, the use of data to create wealth. Um, I, I find that there, there's great, great power in data and understanding trends, especially today when we have an exponential trend of a kind that no one has ever seen before. And to understand what that really means for investors and for, um, for, for all of our pocketbooks. And that's something that's become a passion of mine. And uh, that's what I'm known for. And uh, somewhere on the line, uh, along the, the line of this uh, tagline of the mad scientist of multifamily, you know, got thrown out and got stuck. And so I kind of sort of like it now because the sort of experiments that I run in my, on my multifamily portfolio, I have a $250 million portfolio. Uh, those experiments sometimes do seem to be fairly mad when I run them. And the sort of videos that I put out um, are get me a lot of flack, including one I did on coronavirus 10 days ago, where I predicted large scale quarantines in the US. And and for the first, you know, usually my videos get interesting feedback from real estate people, but this one actually, it, it, it got, you know, 20 times more views than my typical videos do. And people that I've never heard of, have never been part of my, you know, Facebook or real estate group were just coming out and calling me a total nut and a, you know, and, and here we are nine days after that video has been published. And I live in the San Francisco Bay Area with 8 million people in quarantine. Uh, no, it is. Power beta. Well, and I think, you know, to your, to your uh, point there about uh, people, do, do you feel like it's denial or is it, uh, I mean, because honestly, two and a half weeks ago, I remember getting a robo call about how, um, you know, the, there was a, an infection with somebody at the school in, in the school district had been infected and there was, you know, this massive action and it, all of a sudden there was like this immediate kind of like, oh my God, it's here. Uh, kind of thing, but I'm wondering, do, do you think that the, it hasn't, it, for, for the people that are reacting, oh, it's no big deal, is it because it hasn't hit them close, close to where they live? You think it's because they've been told that it's just like the flu? Do you, I, I mean, do you have any sense of that? I do not believe that, that, that the average American, the average person anywhere in the world can understand what is known as an exponential trend. We're designed to understand things that are linear, 10, 11, 12, 13, 10, 20, 30, 40. We have trouble understanding a trend that goes 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. So I'm gonna say something that might seem absurd given how much media coverage the coronavirus has. Everyone watching this podcast still doesn't understand it because exponential curves are so devastating. They move so quickly and they change things so quickly that any kind of response becomes irrelevant by the time you've started rolling it out. So the virus always stays many, many steps ahead of you because you're living in a linear world where you take a step and you wait and you measure and you watch and then you take another step but the virus lives in an exponential world where it doesn't go from 10 to 20, it goes from 10 to 100, and then it goes from 100 to 1,000. So this is unquestionably the deadliest adversary that the world has ever faced. 
nothing comes close to it, not 9-11, not World War II, because World War II was still us fighting other human beings that had the same reaction times. Here, I feel like we're fighting an artificial, you know, bioengineered computer that can think a million times faster. And so by the time we create a reaction to it, it's already at a completely different level and requires a completely different reaction. So to me, it is not about the fact that people, yes, early on, you know, it's about the flu that people, that, that really hurt. Saying to people that it's the flu really, really hurt. But today people know it's not the flu. I think that there are very few Americans left that don't understand how devastating this thing is, but they still cannot understand its impact because the speed at which it grows is not something that they can grab in their mind. And so podcasts like this will help because I'm gonna give you some numbers that are gonna blow your mind, right? But let's just start with the, the whole stupid concept of, you know, is this a flu? Well, it's only a flu in that it comes from the same family of viruses as the, as the influenza, right? But its kill rate, depending upon the country, is 10x to 80x that of the common flu. Its hospitalization costs are 100 times that of the common flu, 100 times higher. Why? Much longer in the hospital, and you require an ICU bed, where very few people with influenza end up in the ICU. They just go to a, a normal bed, or they, you, know, they, you treat them at home. And by the way, there's, there's medicines for influenza, right? There is no known vaccine for this product. It's economic cost due to shutdown, though. That's really where the rubber meets the road, is between 1,000 and 10,000 times that of the flu. 1,000 to 10,000 times the flu. And that's if we stop it with adequate shutdowns. If we don't, then it could be millions of times that of the flu. This thing is capable of taking the world's GDP down, not by 10%, but down so that it's 10% of its former self. It can cut our GDP to one-tenth of what it was. We cannot call it the flu. Now, those numbers are crazy. I mean, just very difficult to uh, comprehend. Uh, you know, before we started recording, you were talking about how like in a normal uh, recession, how uh, we, we talk in percentages. And if you could go through that just a second, yeah. how you're talking about the the uh, up and down and versus what we're facing here. I thought that was. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. say that there's an industry like the hotel industry, right? And mm -hmm. let's say that industry is a $1 trillion a year industry. We'll just use the simple numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, here, for those of you that are watching me on video, I'm, I'm making this thing with my finger. I, this is, a, this is a trillion dollars, right? And if you're listening on audio, then, you know, think about just a trillion bucks. Now the hotel industry goes into a recession, bad things happen. Right. And so we say things like we're used to saying things like, well, instead of there being three percent growth in the hotel industry this year, the hotel industry is going to shrink by five percent, six percent. Right. So the, the hotel industry shrank by about five or six percent in, in the 2008 Great Recession. Right. But remember that when we say six percent down, we're still saying, well, it's still going to be a trillion dollars, but it's going to be six percent less than a trillion dollars. Now, what the coronavirus does is that it wipes out most of the trillion dollars. So you're not going down 6%, you're going down 90% or 80%. And so no recession in history, not the Great Depression in 1929, not World War II, not 2008. At no point did entire industries lose 90% of their revenue in two or three weeks. It's never happened before. We've never even dropped 40 or 50% of revenue. We had about four days of revenue lost in 2001, in 9-11. Airline industry lost about four or five days of revenue, and then they still had future bookings to go on to. But here you have an industry that, um, you know, JetBlue used to bring in $22 million a day. Well, yesterday they bought in $4 million and they gave out $20 million of refund Therefore, their revenue for yesterday was minus $16 million. So as an industry, JetBlue, uh, as a company, almost ceased to exist when it comes to revenue. And at some point, you know, they'll, they'll get to the point where all of their refunds will get paid out, but it's going to take weeks or months. So imagine that trillion all of a sudden getting knocked down to being a tiny fraction of itself. Nothing that we have ever experienced for industries that are trillion-dollar industries has ever happened. And it's, forget about it happening over six months, it happened over three weeks. 
three weeks ago, the stock market still didn't understand this. We knew about coronavirus. We were talking about coronavirus. And I mean, imagine how quickly this thing grows. If you want to understand the exponential nature of it, three weeks ago, the government asked for a billion dollars in aid for coronavirus. Yesterday, they asked for a trillion dollars, 1,000 times in three weeks, because now they're beginning to understand that to fight this thing, the only way to do it is to shut our entire economy down, right? And so it's not like any recession that we have ever experienced or will ever experience in the future. No, I mean, it's just, it's, it's still just shocking just to, to hear those numbers and still try and wrap your head around just the, the gravity of it. It's, it's, um, it's shocking. So let me ask you this, because this is the other thing we talked about. So the fact that it's going from cooking along down to, to zero, do you feel well, like it? Well, not it, well, quite I mean, zero, but you know, maybe okay, 20%. But, but yeah. On life support. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. It, life support it, is the right for, word, right? But just, I mean, it's the complete stoppage of, of activity. Just, I mean, you could, you could drive anywhere you want right now and there'd be no traffic. You could get anywhere you wanted to. Uh, it, it just, it, it just, it is very hard to comprehend just to look around and see just the zero activity. Um, my question to you is as this thing, uh, as we work our way through it, do you feel like because of where the economy was, will it bounce back to its pre-corona? Or do you think there'll be some um, sustained um, you know, regression? I, I think it's impossible for it to bounce back. I think that the, this thing has created so much damage already and will create so much damage in the next few days that at this point, most economists that are responsible are predicting a recession. Now, it may be a six-month recession, and I'm hopeful that it's a six-month recession, not a very long one. Um, but it's certainly going to be different from every other recession that we will ever face. It will, the, the job losses from in 2008, when, you know, we went all the way to 10.5% unemployment rate, if you remember, correct? But it yeah. took one year to get to 10.5%. We're going to get to 10.5% here in the next three weeks. And then we're going to get higher than 10.5%. Hopefully, after that, we come back down. But the, the key point I want to make here is this. There was no alternative. The Trump you know, administration fought this all the way. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to have shutdowns. They, they knew the economic consequence of this. But I want to tell the people in this podcast that this is the best outcome because this thing is so incredibly dangerous and so, so exponential in its growth that the alternative to shutdown was so much worse, not just worse, but so much worse that it's very hard to comprehend. And to illustrate that, I wanna give you some more of my numbers. On the 1st of March, I mean, imagine how much our world has changed in 18 days. 18 days ago, the United States had, had states had 75 cases and no one had died 18 days ago. Um, on the 16th, two days ago, we had 4,600 people sick, up from 75 to 4,006. The, the, yesterday, we had 2,000 people, 2,000 cases in one day. 18 days ago, we had 75. Yesterday, we had 2,000 cases. Because the virus is on such a clear exponential upward growth curve, not only are the numbers going up, but the rate at which they are going up is also going up, making it very hard to deal with it. As a result, if we don't slow this thing down, it will infect two thirds of our population in less than 30 days. That would be, and, that'd be 190 million people infected in 30 days. Obviously, we're going to slow it down with, with lockdowns, right? So obviously, all these social distancing, stuff like that, you know, clearly works. And what's interesting is I'm seeing it work in other countries. I haven't seen it work in the US at all yet. By the way, the net impact so far on the infection rate has been zero. But it takes about seven days of these harsh measures for it to show. So I can tell you, that it, it is working in Italy. Italy had 3,000 new infections yesterday, but its rate of growth is only about 
between 12 and 13 percent a day, where the U.S. rate rate of growth is 33 percent, right? Because they've right. already enforced the quarantines and have had them for seven straight days. Iran is down to 12 to 9 percent a day, where they were at 40 percent a day before they enforced quarantines. It works, but it's devastating. Wow. wow. You know, the other piece of that 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 I think uh, is is uh underreported is just the number of tests and the number of cases that are actually identified. I know uh, here in Oregon, uh, there's, you know, the, just the, the number of tests that are, they're performing on a daily basis is, you know, minimal compared to uh, like what California or, or elsewhere is doing and just the ability to do the test. I think testing matters more in the early stages. Um, if you look at the, the remarkable success, there are two success stories in the world. One is South Korea, uh, which right now is at a 1% daily growth rate. So the last five days, South Korea has been 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, and 1% in daily growth rate. We're at 33, 32% daily growth rate. But they did their testing very early. So if you look at their graph, very early, they had like 20, 30, 40% growth days when they were testing like crazy. I think at this point, we are beyond that point. You know, we, we need to move into containment. The only way to contain the, pe this thing is to separate people. Right. Um, and I think testing helps. So I'm, I'm, I certainly think it's, it's a great idea that we're doing more testing and drive-by testing and all those things help. But the bottom line today is the public, either it cares or it doesn't. It's up to the politicians to save us. For once, what matters is what the politicians do. That the mayors, the governors, and the president is what really matters. Right. Now, in, in, as far as the uh, testing went, I just meant as, as far as the numbers being underreported, not, not that that would contain it. I think I absolutely am agree, in agreement with you that, you know, just separating people and stopping the movement of people mm -hmm. from, you know, one group to another and cross-pollinating kind of thing is really what we have to, to uh, stop. Well, having said that, I think that testing helps, and and the you know obviously what what testing does is that it prevents that person that is infected from having any interaction with anybody else. Because remember, this virus it's depending on each person that is infected. It's depending on it infecting three to four more people, and that gives us its uh, godlike powers, its exponential power to basically become 10x every 10, 15 days comes from the fact that each infected person has to infect three or four. If you can get that down to one, then we are in a much better place. It's not going to go away, but it's, going, right. it's not going to over, overwhelm us. At the current rate, 33% is the U.S. daily rate. It is going to overwhelm our healthcare system within 12 or 13 days. Wow. That's how fast it is. That's, it's just still, it boggles the mind to think of that, uh, those numbers. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how you see this affecting uh, real estate and specifically multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, I'll so, let you... yeah, um, this is where I feel very lucky to be in real estate. I mean, I'm looking at the absolute bloodbath. You know, we are we're talking at 3 p.m. on March 18th, where the stock market has just had another one of its worst ever days. It's now wiped out all of the gains since the Trump presidency began. And I think was down about 2,000 points today after being down another 10,000 points in the last 10 days. And we've never really seen these kinds of catastrophic drops. So I'm really happy that I don't have any money in the stock market, that I have money in real estate, because the problem with stock markets is they are so real time that if there's panic, you know, the, the VIX index uh, measures panic in the stock market and it's the highest it's, it's been in history, the, that panic builds upon itself. What we have in real estate is we almost have this automatic circuit breaker where we really, we, we measure everything that we do in months, year and years. We don't measure things in days, right? Our tenants don't pay us rent every day. Right. So our tenants, what you know that when you know we had no impact in at the beginning of March because there was just wasn't enough mental uh, knowledge of this for tenants to think oh I'm not going to pay rent. I know I'm going to get affected on April first when many tenants are like oh my government thinks that if I don't pay rent you know they're not going to let me be evicted so maybe I won't pay rent. But what's nice is that we have between now and then 
to, to formulate counter strategies. So many strategies. So number one, which is going to be a strategy that all of my properties will use is, we'll wait until the 10th of April. Many of the people will pay rent because their jobs are not affected or they don't want the, the hit on their credit history or they just think that this is temporary. It's the flu, it's gonna go away. I'm just gonna pay my rent. I don't wanna make a big deal. I don't wanna get evicted. Then there's gonna be maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 40% of the people that are going to be like, well, I'm not gonna pay. Well, then we're gonna call those people and we're gonna say, would you like to, to modify your lease? Let's say you're paying me a thousand bucks a month and you have six months left on your lease. I will give you the month of April for free and I will take the thousand dollars from April and I'll stack it on the remaining five months. So now your rent becomes 1200 bucks a month for the next five months and you can have the month of April for me on free, right? And then those people, many of them will say, okay, fine. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that by May, this thing will be gone. It's just a flu. I will get my job back. Fine, I'll, I'll sign your lease. Now that he signs his lease, this, this lease modification, I'm a, again in a good place, right? Because our, our communities typically have multiple months worth of, um, of operating um, you know, uh, buffers. So if 30% if of my tenants don't pay in a particular month, I'm not even sure if I'm going to go upside down, right? I mean, I might go upside down. So what? That's what operational buffers are for. I'm going to stop distributing cash flow to my investors. So I love the fact that I, I, I live in a world where there's this buffer of cash flow that I can just use whenever there's a crisis and boy, are we in a crisis now? So that's that option. And then you realize that unlike the stock market, each one of our properties, even though the property is 200 units and it costs $20 million, each one of them is a small business because the rents are under $5 million at every single property I own. Therefore, every single LLC is, is a small business. Therefore, every single LLC is going to qualify for the $250 billion that small businesses are, are supposed to receive from the government coming April 1st. So my relief will be there even before my tenants start defaulting, we are already trying to figure out where are the forms that we need to fill out because on April 15th, whatever amount of shortfall there is for my tenants, I'm going to apply for that amount as a small business that's affected. This is money that the government is gifting us. It is not a loan. It is money that you get simply because, you know, your, your community is hurt, right? And as long as we can show proof that rents were hurt, I believe that we can go and get a, a portion of that money back. And we have the time to make adjustments. Also, because we only pay mortgages once a month, and if tenants cannot be evicted, we cannot, defaults cannot happen either, right? So if the government is going to stop tenants from being evicted, then the same government has to prevent lenders from foreclosing on apartment communities because that would put all of those tenants out on the street because no one is running that property, right? right. Who's right. gonna pay their gas bill? Who's gonna pay their water bill? Who's gonna pay you know, for, for utilities? There will be chaos. Right. So what that means is that if worst case comes to worst, I can choose to not pay my mortgage for the next 90 days and have no recourse because the banks will have to take the hit. And guess what? Those banks, someone's going to take care of it. Uh, uh, the government will take care of them because the banks never lose in the big picture, right? right. They've got the, the most powerful lobby. Somebody will pay them for it. So I've got time to react. I do not need to make daily decisions. I make decisions once a month and I have recourse. Whereas in the stock markets, things move so quickly, Darren, that, that, Everyone makes constant decision-making because they're terrified of being left behind and it just spirals out of control. So I do think that there's a negative impact to real estate, but I think that it's, it depends on how long this goes on. If we implement nationwide quarantines, I think the impact to real estate is going to be for the next three or four months. If we try to do this spot quarantine business that we've been doing in the US so far, which is disastrous, then we could see a very large impact to real estate and it could be, you know, over a year or two instead of over a few months. Right. No, I, 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 uh, I like your, um, you know, kind of the, the, the story there, not the story, but the, your, your, your sense of things with, uh, a, 
this money. I mean, the, the, the government's already said, hey, we're, we're going to make this money available. You've got the tenants uh, and how to work with them as far as um, whether it be uh, getting the rent and, and, and the percentage that will think that uh, I don't have to pay or, or you know, but work with them. To, I, I guess we've, we've got time. And again, as opposed to like the stock market and you're watching the thing go down and down and down and down, and then you end up selling at the bottom and watch it race back up and you're not in it kind of thing. This gives you that kind of that, not just the, the, the capital buffer that you have built into yours, but the time buffer, you know, that you were saying is it to, to make these decisions and that. Um, I think that is kind of, sometimes that's one of the, the saving, it can save a lot of investors from making a really stupid decision because uh, you can't make a really fast decision in real estate. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, yeah. Having said that, you know, what's funny about real estate is that this crisis could be over before real estate reacts to it. That's how fast it is, right? My prediction still is that today is the 18th of March. By the 25th of March, the government will be beaten into national quarantine by the experts because anybody that can do math can do the same math that I'm doing. If we stay anywhere close to a 10, 20, 30% daily growth rate, we're finished. So, I mean, really, that, that is the, that's the right term to use. We're finished. We're, we're going to be within 20, 30 days, we'll run out of ICU beds. And then after that, it's just pandemonium. And so there's no choice but to do what the San Francisco Bay Area did. And what the Bay Area did was exactly the right medicine. It is the harshest medicine any, uh, you know, any um, area of the U.S. has ever administered to itself. But I think that the New Yorkers are completely insane in not following, you know, what, what San Francisco is doing. This morning, of the 900 new cases that I saw this morning, 773 were in New York out of 900. That's 80 plus percent of all U.S. cases. It is out of control there. They must have multiple, uh, you know, they, they call it, you know, case, case, cluster, cluster, boom. Well, they're booms. They've got to have a half dozen booms going on simultaneously. You can't control all of them. So it makes sense at this point to put New York in quarantine. Well, and each one of those booms will continue to uh, create a an additional boom as they, they keep spreading there. So that's... Exactly. The booms basically lead to new cases. And once again, you start this cycle yeah. of case, case, cluster, cluster, boom. And yeah. that boom is so explosive and the, the cases grow so fast that it's very hard to, to react. I mean, remember two and a half weeks ago when we have all these cases in, in Seattle and, and in California, at that point, New York had two or three cases, right? All the focus was California and, and, and Seattle and, and they were still talking about what they're going to do. And then they have 773 cases today. It, right. it just narks. It's completely out of control. Right. Um, what do you see or, or do you see any um, uh, benefit or, or to operators and real estate investors as far as the, the lending rates? Um, you know, we've talked about uh, the Fed rate going to near zero. Um, do you see that translating and, and being a long-term I don't mean long term, but do you think there's an opportunity here for investors to refinance, or do you think this will will uh, affect uh, the market as far as buyers and sellers and and that here in the near term, or do you think that's is the market being disrupted? I I can only tell you what I've seen anecdotally. The market already for properties that were in contract is being disrupted. So people properties are falling out of contract. Um, but brokers are now calling and asking for people to make offers. So in the short term, there is definitely a disruption in the multifamily market. I don't think it lasts if we fix this. If four weeks from now, we look like China or Hong Kong, it was just an aberration because fundamentally the market's very strong and the interest rates, if anything, give us another two or three years of growth. So it, the answer to your question depends on what do you believe, Darren? It, do you believe that in four or five weeks, the Bay Area or, it, well, parts of the, the United States that are affected? Clearly, not the whole country is affected, right? There's West Virginia only has one case, whereas, you know, New York, just the city of New York has 773. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. So if you look at our big case clusters, right, there's one in Georgia, there's one in, in, in Northern California, one in SoCal, 
Washington, New York, these big places, if we go into quarantine now and just bite the bullet, four weeks from now, these areas will come out of quarantine. I don't think that, that I think that normal service resumes in multifamily. I do not think that normal service resumes for other sectors. I think that this is a wake up call that will change the cap rates for malls, for retail, and for hotel assets. And that the, the, the effects of that will be felt for years to come. Because for the first time, the people that really make the market, the billionaires, the mega billionaires that have huge pension funds are seeing that assets that are need-based assets are doing a lot better than assets that are want-based assets because the government is much more likely to shut down want-based assets in favor of need-based assets, right? That's what we're really doing. We're saying we need to be healthy at this point in time. So bottom line is the big winners, the long-term winners are likely to be multifamily and self-storage, but I think there's bigger winners. I think the biggest winner is hospital type assets. The people that used to build medical offices, the people that build hospitals, it's inevitable that once this massive crisis passes, we will shore up our healthcare infrastructure. So the total number of beds in the US five years from now for ICUs will definitely be much higher. So I think that my sector is a kind of, sort of, less affected, sort of a winner, but I think it's the medical office sector that's the big winner. And I think the hotels, the malls, the strip malls, the retail centers, they are not short-term losers. I do not expect their cap rates to snap back. I expect to see a wave of bankruptcies in hotels and in strip malls in Q2, Q3, Q4 of this year, Things, you know, normal service will resume, but not as quickly as people think. What about uh, office? Um, do you see any kind of disruption there from the standpoint of people are, are getting more comfortable working remotely? Uh, will the, uh, the, the company that's been leasing, you know, large square footage start to look for ways to downsize and, and uh, you know, use the technology to disperse their, their people? Do you see anything? I mean, there? Not so much. I'm not so sure that that will happen. And, and the big reason for that, I think, is that a lot of offices sign very long-term leases. So they're going to see temporary disruptions because people still pay by the month, right? So even yeah. though they're signing long-term leases. And it's unclear to me that this one cataclysmic effect changes the way that America works. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Certainly a lot of new people are learning e-learning and those sorts of things. But I hesitate to say that the whole office sector a year from now is going to look very different from how it looks because of this. So let's, you know, again, what do you believe there? I mean, do you believe that this is a four week aberration? In which case, yeah, I think office will snap back um, because employers like to have people work in offices. And I don't think that that's going to change in going into the future. Whereas I do believe that the massive bounce that Amazon is receiving, some portion of that is going to be temporary. They, they are begging for employees. They raised their minimum wage $2 last week. Um, they've uh, requested 200,000 additional people. They're actually specifically going around saying, if you're affected by retail closures, we would like you to come work for us. Because if retail reopens, well, then we're not going to need you anyway. So it's perfect. The timing is perfect. Come work for us. And then we, when retail reopens, our bounce will be over. But some of that bounce, I think, is permanent. So I, I, I do think that you're going to see um, you know, e-commerce stay up at a new norm. So you know, obviously, right now, e-commerce is through the roof, right? Just insane right. growth. But I think when it comes back, it doesn't come back down to where it was. It stays above that level. So... Yeah, some impact on office, but I think the, the big losers definitely are going to be the travel groups because, because what, what happens with travel is that it was, tra you know, especially the, the airline and hotel industry, it's a daily industry, right. right? It's an everyday industry, and the vast majority of the time, they've had to give refunds. So almost all the airlines have had to give refunds. But what, what office in the United States has refunded anybody? 
Nobody right. has refunded a dime. So we cannot compare the, the catastrophic impact that we've had in the airline industry and the, and the hotel industry and, and compare that to the office industry. Right. No, it's, it is a, uh, it's just crazy when you start to think about all of the disruption in travel and, and hotels and conferences and, and uh, I mean, just the way we do business and, and just how, how dramatic that is. It's just, it's crazy to think. Um, yep. Also, one, one thing I wanted to point out is that let us say that I'm right. And by the 25th of March, the U.S. goes into quarantine and then comes out three or four weeks later. I believe that international travel restrictions will stay for months, which means that the offices will get filled up again. The restaurants will get filled up again, but the hotels will not because a very significant portion of their, their uh, you know, residents the money was coming in from international travel, right? right? And I don't think that we will allow that to resume for many, many, many months. So my prediction, large scale bankruptcies and liquidations coming for hotels in the second half of Q2 and then all of Q3. Wow. Even if we snap back, even if we snap back, because this was a daily business, right? right? So I think the bigger bailouts are not going to be the airline industry. The airline industry wants 58 billion bucks. Fine, we should give it to them and, and you know, take that money back later with interest. I think the hotel industry is going to need a much bigger bailout. And I'm not sure that we should bail them out at this point because some of that business is gone for a much longer time. Oh. No, that, that, that timeline you uh, painted for reasons uh, that make sense, that's just, uh, that's a big, big number. Well, I have to say that multifamily will suffer too. I, I am certainly not thinking of this as a positive. I mean, I saw something on Facebook yesterday that stunned me, Darren. Somebody said, now everybody's going to figure out that we should be buying multifamily and, and you know, multifamily is going to do much better. People are going to run towards it. None of that stuff happens right now. I mean, we're going to hurt as much as anybody else. So if you look at the REITs that have crashed, Obviously, senior housing REITs crashed the most, right? I mean, because of right. the Washington thing, they've crashed 49%. But apartment REITs are down 22%. Uh, Self-storage REITs are only down 11%. Self-storage is considered to be the most recession-resistant, you know, sector in multifamily. So that, you know, in, 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 uh, in real estate, so that, that made sense. Single-family REITs are down about 15, 16%. So bottom line is, we are going to hurt. And it's likely that we will see defaults. It's likely that we will see some distressed sales in multifamily as well. We're not exempt from this. But is there any other part of the real estate spectrum that I would want to be in today? I don't know. Maybe I would have wanted more, multi, more storage uh, projects than I already have. Uh, but no, I mean, on, I'm fairly happy with where I am. I'm just very glad that I didn't buy a bunch of hotels. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I like your perspective there. I mean, there is, the, the hurt's going to get spread around. It's not going to be limited to uh, uh, just a few. Um, but I, I do like the uh, prospects for the, uh, the bounce back. And I think the, the, the big takeaway from this conversation is we need to get through this. And we have to, there's going to be yes. like some dramatic action that has to be taken in order to get through it. It's, it's rip off the Band-Aid. Um, it's, it's the most painful Band-Aid yeah. in history. But the good right. news is it's also the quickest Band-Aid in history. 2008 lingered and lingered and lingered. Right. This is not like that, right? So it's, it, it's 10x the pain in one tenth of the time. Let's just rip it off. Well, and, and with that, uh, let me ask you just uh, before we close here, um, the, the faster we get through this, do you feel like that will, will help uh, those industries or those businesses that were, I mean, uh, would it not help more, more businesses survive? as opposed to a longer, a longer. I think so. I, yeah. I, and, I, and I think that if it's too long, then, then we, we go beyond survival. We, go, we get to the end of days type of scenarios. So um, it's not just that survival rates will improve if we do it quickly. You know, we may not survive. Our, our economy may not survive if we don't do this quickly. But, but I'm, I, I feel positive about this and I'll tell you why. When I made my original video on the 11th, seven days ago, I was not in a positive frame of mind because no municipality in the US had done quarantining. Now we've got Ro the city of Rochelle in New York. They're in quarantine. San Francisco Bay Area is in quarantine. 
And then the rest of the U.S. is kind of sort of in quarantine, right? Lots of, I mean, schools are closed in, in almost every state in the union, but restaurants and pubs are closed in most states. And the ones that are not will close over the next week. So I think we are ripping off the Band-Aid. I think that we're going to do this right. And so in my mind, by the time we recognize how catastrophic the job losses are, the jobs will be back. So I feel positive about it. We're all going to suffer, but not as much as most people think. Got it. Neil, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time today to uh, do this. I, um, you know, it's not exactly the, uh, the, the topic I, I thought we were going to talk about originally, but I think it's, it's, it's definitely on everybody's mind and definitely applicable and, and uh, will be uh, well received. Um, where can the listeners go if they'd like to uh, connect or learn more? Uh, well, two things. One is I created a resource website. It has no advertisement of any kind. It's called coronavirusrealestate.com. So go there. We're posting videos of where we see this thing going and the impact on real estate. Because the problem is, I mean, CNN's not going to tell you anything about real estate, right? They don't give a damn. The real estate is not a big sector, right? They, they're, they're talking about the stock market. But if you're in real estate, you need to understand what are brokers thinking, right? What are commercial brokers thinking, right? Is, are there defaults occurring in our, in our marketplace? What's happening to rents? And so the, this website, Coronavirus Real Estate, is the right place to go. But for everything else in multifamily, uh, our website is multifamilyu.com. That's multifamily followed by the letter u.com. It also has some coronavirus-related content, but it has huge amounts of content related to asset management, the legal aspects of multifamily and syndication, and just a hundred other topics. Got it. Well, Neil, uh, thanks again. I uh, always learn a lot. I appreciate you uh, taking the time. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Awesome. Bye. All right. All right. For listeners, uh, if you like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And remember, as always, the more you know, the more you grow. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.